coming and thanks so much to the Olympians for being here. I really appreciate it. This event kind of serves dual purpose. So first of all, Sochi Olympics, you know, we've got Steamboat people there, but our Olympic legacy here in Steamboat Springs is second to none. And you can learn all about that at the museum, and so I don't want to go into too much depth about that. But our Olympic heritage um, spans all the way back to Carl Housen, and our first Olympians went in 1932, John Steele. And we're still going strong. Um, and I just wanted to kind of get our Olympians together with the public basically to celebrate that, to, to bring kind of Steamboat Sochi connection to, um, here during this time during the Olympics rather than everybody just kind of be glued to the TV. I know that, um, I think the schools did a little Olympian thing a couple of weeks ago, right? Soda Creek or Strawberry Park. Um, you, you were saying something about that, Todd, weren't you? The kids, the kids were doing something. So um, we wanted to get you guys all together and, and hear some stories and, and share your experiences. And then also we recorded this for our oral history archive. And so that will be in perpetuity in our collection. And so it, people who couldn't come, but also just for what museums do, which is preserving the past <coughs> and present for the future. So that's the other reason. I should introduce myself. I'm Candace Bannister. I'm the executive director of the Tredic Pioneers Museum. We've got Katie Adams here, our curator, and Tamara Monahan, our assistant. And what we're going to do is basically just kind of be really informal. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to ask, and you guys can kind of just go down the line and answer it how you want. You can not answer it if you don't want. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to have a couple of questions, and then Tamara's going to have a couple of questions, and then um, we're going to open up the floor to the audience to be able to ask questions as well. Um, probably go to maybe just a little bit after 7 o'clock since we got a little bit of a late starter. And then Deb or anybody who has to go, you know, feel free to go. Johnny Spillane should be here in a few minutes. And Billy Kidd did RSVP that he's going to be here. So I'm assuming he's coming, but um, Johnny did let us know that he was going to be late. So I just want to start. Um, first of all, we've got name tags in front of everybody. but. Um, just want to kind of go in a line and just say your name, the Olympics that you attended, and the year of that Olympics, and the sport that you competed in. And the real part of the question is um, share your most memorable Olympic experience. So that's the first question. Do you want to start, Erin? <laughs> My name is Erin Simmons Nemec, and I raced snowboard cross, snowboarding. So I don't know if anyone saw the paper today, those girls in the air there, that's what I did. And actually the one in the front of the, that was my teammate back then. And so yeah, 2006 was my Olympics in Torino, Italy. And I also did eight X Games. So that was the other side of my competition was X Games and some World Cups and stuff like that. And most memorable from Olympics, I think was probably just being in the Olympic villages and in the athlete village. You know, you go down to dinner in the athlete village and you're sitting there and you see, oh my gosh, there's that hockey guy that, you know, you've seen on TV so many times and then you're thinking, oh, he's eating this, the exact same thing as me and we're in the lineup, the same, you know, and you just, you feel a little bit equal to him and that, that was a really cool moment for me. I was just, you know, and oh, there he is, there he is, and then I'm like, oh wait, I'm, just, I'm one of these too, you know, so that was my really cool moment. I'm Deb Armstrong and I competed in the 1984-1988 Olympics and most memorable uh, Olympic moment, oh alpine ski racing was what I competed in, thank you. And I suppose I just have to say winning I guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean that wasn't the first thing that came to my mind when asked that question. I, it, it's just a, a mountain of, of memories. Uh, but I suppose the biggest thing is winning. I, I'll, I won't forget riding up the chairlift in Calgary and yeah, it, four years later, I was, it was a triple and I would, had my arms on the chair like this. I was riding by myself and I'm thinking, wow, four years is a really long time to be reigning champion at something. And thinking, huh, that's gonna end in about a half hour. <laughs> because going into 84, I mean, I was poised to win a medal. I, I had a third and I had a fifth going right into the games and I was there to win. Or I was there to podium, That's that. those were my thoughts. But 84, 88, uh, I had had an injury and, you know, it was kind of a sputtery start and stop kind of year. And uh, I wasn't going to win a medal in 88, and I knew that. Um, so those are a, kind of a couple contrasts of an Olympics for me. But 
Yeah, I mean, the Olympics is, uh, it, I don't know, it's just an amazing amount of metaphors and stories and, uh, and it's hard to sum up in a paragraph. <laughs> Sounds <kind of> nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just got started and we started at this end, so Billy, we might as well, uh, if you want to, if you want to chime in and we'll continue on, does that work? Do you want to say the question? Yeah, so <laughs> just your name, the Olympics you attended, the year, and your most uh, memorable Olympic experience. All right, my name is Billy Kidd. <clears throat> I was in the Olympics just a few short decades ago. <laughs> like five decades ago. This is the 50th anniversary of the uh, 64 Olympics. And uh, I was in the Olympics with Buddy Warner. He was my hero when I was growing up in Vermont. I had pictures of him on my wall. And then we went to the Olympics together and Buddy was gracious enough to slow down in the slalom and let me and my teammate, Jimmy Hugo, win medals. <laughs> well, he didn't actually do it on purpose, but I thought that was really gracious of him. And uh, some of you may know that Buddy was killed in an avalanche right after the Olympics in 64, and this mountain is named for him. Uh, and I was uh, in the Olympics with his uh, brother, Loris, uh, and uh, then I was in the 68 Olympics also with Moose Barrows. Now, is Moose coming here too? I did not hear back from Moose, so okay. I'm guessing it's a no. So Moose Barrows, some of you may know the name Moose Barrows, and some of you may know his story. And I think it's pretty interesting because in the 68 Olympics, Jean-Claude Keeley hogged all the gold medals. He won downhill slalom and giant slalom. But Moose Barrows from Steamboat almost beat Jean-Claude Keeley in the downhill. Except halfway down the downhill, Moose had a slight miscalculation. <laughs> Went off a bump about 60 miles an hour, did about a one and three quarters back flip with about a one and three quarters twist and single-handedly invented the sport of freestyle aerials. <laughs> While alpine skiing. Yeah, in the middle of the downhill. But he also um, became famous, and I think all, most of you are too young to remember, no. Wide World of Sports. Yep. But one of the greatest sports shows, and it opened with the words, Sports are the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory was Franz Klammer in a yellow suit winning the downhill in 1976. The agony of defeat was Moose Barrows doing his one and three quarters backflip and going right to the hospital instead of the podium. But in those days we had uh, just such great experiences, just going to the Olympics. And nobody, hi Johnny. How are you? Good, thanks, how are you doing? Sorry I'm late. <laughs> I don't work. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Anyway. Okay. I was late too, sorry. <laughs> in, any, in any case, in those days, uh, Americans went to the Olympics, kind of like Johnny Spillane, thinking, Oh, the Europeans, they dominate our sport. Nobody expected him to go to the Olympics or the World Championships and come back with a medal because Americans didn't do that. The Europeans dominated ski racing, what I did, and Nordic Combine, what you did. And so we didn't have great expectations, except our parents did, and Bob Beatty, our coach, did. And so in the 64 Olympics, when Jimmy Hugo and I won our medals, uh, we were not the favorites. We surprised ourselves. Uh, but it was just a great memory about those Olympics. And this is what they gave me. You know what this is? It's a silver medal. I missed the gold medal by 14 hundredths of a second. Blink your eye. That's 14 hundredths of a second. So I spent the next six years trying to make up 14 hundredths of a second. 
So one year in the World Championships, I was even closer, six hundredths of a second, half the time it takes to blink your eye, and I won a bronze medal. Another year in the World Championships, I missed winning by seven thousandths of a second. And I tried to convince the timers that was a tie, but they didn't go for that. <laughs> so finally, after six years, this is what I won, was a gold medal in the World Championships. And this is what Johnny Spillane won also, that changed his sport and just made sports news because as I understand it, Johnny, Nordic Combined is the oldest skiing event in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And yet no Americans had won medals in Olympics or World Championships until you won gold in the World Championships and then won, uh, but Billy DeMong, your teammate, won gold in the Olympics and you won how many, six or eight silver medals? <laughs> three. Oh, only three. <laughs> three medals. <laughs> So anyway, that's everything I know. Now it's your turn. <laughs> what are so, we talking about? So the, so the opening question yes. um, was just your name, the Olympics that you attended, um, and the years of those Olympics, and your most uh, memorable Olympic experience. Okay. Um, I'm Johnny Spillane. Uh, I went to the 98 Olympics, 02, 06, and 2010. Um, my most memorable experience I don't really know if I have a most memorable experience because it was, it was, all of them were memorable in their own way and for different reasons. I think um, one of the most memorable certainly was competing in Salt Lake and being able to compete in front of your home crowd. Uh, there's a different sort of feeling and pressure and environment that comes with that. It's, you know, it's one thing to go to the Olympics. It's another thing to be able to do it in your home country, which is was really, truly pretty special. I think probably the most memorable part of it for me was when our team got um, fourth place at those Olympics, because that was a big turning point for my career. Kind of showed us that yes, we were close, we were on the right track, but we we're gonna have to do more to get better. And then that next year was the when I won that first world championship. So I think for me, that was the time when I had a turning point in what I was doing and realized that we could be successful, but it was gonna take a little bit more work. So I think we're on Nelson now. Okay. I'm Nelson Carmichael, and I went to 1988 in Calgary, and then 92 in Albertville, France, uh, and in freestyle skiing, um, which at the time was moguls and aerials. And you see freestyle skiing now, there's lots of events. Slope style was added this year to it, and it's all kind of under the umbrella of freestyle, at least at the Olympics. Um, but then it was a little bit simpler with moguls and aerials, and so I did moguls. And uh, my probably most memorable experience, um, yeah, there's, there's many, many memories for sure. And some of them blend together and some of them come up. But when people ask me that question, what first comes to mind is uh, in 92, going up for the final run, we had a, the semifinal run the day before. And in Mogul's then, how it worked was one semifinal run, which meant the whole field goes once. And that it's just in random order. Uh, we have a judge to advance, judge for it, and so it's typically a little bit better to go later. So anyway, they just the first run is random. You don't know where you're gonna go. Everybody goes once. You get a score, and the top 16 at that time would go in the final run, and then it was the next day. And it's only those 16, and they go in reverse order from the semifinal. So typically, the good skiers go later, and the scores come up a little bit. And I qualified fourth had kind of a mistake and I thought the fourth's not too bad. It's a lot of pressure to, to win the semifinal and then you run last and there's more pressure on that typically. So it's nice to end up high, but sometimes not too high. So anyway, I thought it was an okay place. But leading up to that Olympics, I, there's a lot of hype, there's training camps, there's getting stuff together, of course. You're always on the road, you can't get anything together anyway. And um, there's media, there's, um, you go through processing before the Olympics, there's always something going on, there's always people around. There's all these Olympi um, U.S. Olympic Committee people that come around that you've never seen before, and all of a sudden they're working with you on your team, and that's a little odd. So it's just more and more stuff all the time, and I just kept remembering I always wanted a, just a little bit of time away, just a little sliver of 
just some alone time. And I never really, I never got it until I went up for that final run and the T-bar went way up higher than the course did. We had a T-bar right next to the mobile course and you could just jump off the T-bar kind of like here at Howlson where you just jump, okay, I'm gonna go exit two and jump off and ski right here. It was kind of like that for moguls. Um, so instead of jumping off there and going right to the run and waiting for my run, I went all the way to the top and there was nobody around. Um, and I just always remember that moment of finally having that, that little sliver of time with just myself and kind of gather my thoughts and, and then go take a run. Uh, so that was, besides winning a medal, besides family, that's always what comes to mind. It's kind of odd. Um, I'm Caroline Lalive. Michael, it's an awful. I want this guy. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, I was in the 98 um, O2 and then sadly got hurt uh, at the 06 Olympics training, so didn't actually get to compete there. But um, so, my, in my most memorable Olympic experience, um, interestingly, people often say this, but the opening ceremonies um, are really pretty impressive. Um, I didn't get to walk in the opening ceremonies in, in Japan in 98, so O2, um, we actually competed the next day, so there was kind of some controversy whether or not to, to walk, because I'm sure you heard on the news or this last Olympic, it's about a four hour, five hour ordeal, and the night before the Olympics, your, your big thing, the last thing you want to be doing is standing outside just waiting around, but um, I think a lot of athletes choose to do it because of the experience and kind of the the sensation and the moment that it is and so um, that would probably be one of the top things on mine is just walking in and you get that moment that it's really what the Olympics are all about um, and actually another really cool moment is um, is after the Olympics uh, as an Olympic athlete you get to go to the White House um, the whole Olympic team does and you go and meet the president um, and that's pretty cool because it's after the, the stress of the games and, and you, you go in April and everyone's, you know, their season's finished. And um, that's when you actually really, in my opinion, you get to meet your fellow athletes because at the uh, games you're really focused. And as an al Alpine athlete, we would always stay separate. We wouldn't even stay in the village. Um, so you didn't really see a lot of other people. So that was the first time for me where I got to, to meet whatever, 300 other Winter Olympians. and and meet the president, which was pretty cool. Hi, I'm Todd Wilson, and I competed in the 1988-1992 Olympics in Nordic combined. Uh, 88 was in Calgary, and 92 was in Albertville. And uh, I guess I have a number of memorable experiences, um, and I'm sure tomorrow I'll think of three or four more. But. Um, it, it seems like it's a memorable exper experience after a memorable experience after a memorable experience because there's so many things you've never done before. Um, but the, the first one has to be when, when you're actually being named as, as being on the Olympic team. And just that feeling of having worked so hard, and, and I had had this as a goal since I was uh, my daughter's age, you know, eight, nine years old, that this is something I wanted to do. So to finally have that moment where you think you're gonna do it, all things are lining up, but there's so many things that could happen, so many things that could go wrong, and when you finally uh, cross that border and, and you're named as an Olympian, that's a pretty special feeling. And I'll never forget that, because it's, it's something you've worked for for years, your whole life, and you don't remember not having that as a goal. Um, so I remember that, I also remember walking into the opening ceremonies, uh, and just the magnitude of that, I wasn't really prepared for that. Um, just how that would feel, uh, knowing that the whole world is watching and, and being there with all your friends and teammates and, and uh, um, just the magnitude of that was pretty special. And uh, I remember sitting on the, in the, on the bar on the ski jump and looking down at the crowd and, and just kind of having that moment where everything went quiet and, and it was like, this is it. This is what you work for. And it was so different than I had thought it was going to be. Um, but I just remember enjoying that moment. And then in, in Albertville, um, we were using a new technique in ski jumping in the V-stop. Half the world had figured it out, or maybe not even, maybe a third of the world had figured it out, and two thirds hadn't. So you had this mixture of people that were trying the new technique, and we knew that it was working, but not everybody had mastered it. Um, we even had a couple of teams 
on the sly come to Steamboat because they didn't want the rest of the world to know that they were, they were training it because they knew it was an advantage. Um, so just having been through that, and I went through that in cross country as well, when it went from classic skiing to skating, and then to have gone through, uh, in both sports, a major change where we had to change our equipment, our training, everything. Um, and when we went from the, the skis straight in front of you to the beat technique, and just uh, being a part of that in, in both sports was, was pretty amazing. And they both happened around Olympic, Olympic time. So um, those are very memorable experiences. Uh, I'm Chris Puckett, and I made the 1992 Olympics in Alberville for Giants Long. Um, I, like Todd, when you find out you make the team, it was pretty special because um, we were at St. Gervais, France. And we just had a World Cup. It didn't go particularly well, but they were naming the Olympic team there for the Alpine Men. And we got called over to the uh, kitchen, or not the kitchen, the place where we all sit before dinner, and they were going to announce it. And I had been told I probably was going to make it. Um, I knew that my brother might make it. Um, but when we sat there, we weren't sure. Um, like Todd But when they said both of our names, we kind of looked at each other. and. Uh, that feeling you get right then is, is just pretty amazing. It's, it's like he said, you wanted to do it your whole life. First time, for me, the only time to get named and to be told I was going to be named. And uh, we just kind of listened to the rest of the team, and then we kind of slowly walked out, walked back to our rooms. And as soon as we got and shut the door, we jumped up. We were jumping up on down, up and down the bed, <laughs> hugging each other, jumping up and down on the bed. Um, got on, on the phone and called our parents and woke them up and um, told them, and we just couldn't believe it. We were so happy. So that, that's really memorable. Um, the next thing is, I've told this story to some people at this table, actually. Um, Billy, you probably, you may or may not remember this, but uh, one of, standing in the start, getting ready to go, um, more cameras at an Olympics than usual at a World Cup, um, one in front, one behind, falling in the start, and uh, Billy is right there at the side of the start. Hadn't been at a World Cup all year, had never met Billy at, the, at that time, and there he is in his classic uh, cowboy hat, and um, he says, well, good luck, Chris, <laughs> right before I went in. And I thought to myself as I, as I pushed in, that, that's Billy Kidd. <laughs> What's he doing here, you know? <laughs> but it was memorable, because it wasn't, it wasn't your uh, thing. I also watched Nelson's run, um, and was inspired by that uh, during those games. Um, but I, I do remember, it was a very sunny day, um, and it was on the front of the mountain in Val d'Isere, very steep, giant slalom, which Tomba, Tomba may not, can Tomba win that one? I can't remember. Um, but I remember watching a French guy go right in front of me. Now, I was starting 31st, so I was not actually ranked in the World Cup for points, but I was the very next person, um, according to the international rankings outside of World Cup. So I started 31st, and the French guy went right in front of me, and it was so loud, I could hear him from the time he left the gate all the way down, and, and the whole finish erupted. So just, I mean, I watched the whole thing. Or, you know, I, I think they've had me start maybe three fourths of the way when he went down. And I thought to myself, my whole plan from inspection went out the window. I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to win this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just got really inspired. Well, uh, I went. It was a very steep course. I went straight at that first gate, and within three gates, I was late, and um, I was in new boots that I hadn't really run a course in really chalky cold snow like that, really back and forth, and, and I had made a mistake with my own equipment and not tested it correctly in the right conditions. Very aggressive, and my legs were shaking, uh, but they weren't set up correctly, and, and I was so exhausted from getting late and hacking my whole way down the course that I missed a gate. And so, opposite of Deb's feeling of remembering the win, I actually missed a gate and went through the finish, and it was silent. And I just watched the French guy how loud it was. And so <laughs> there was a feeling of not really utter failure, although I'm sure some people define it that way, but very memorable in how it was actually not what I expected um, at all, and, and not what I'd hoped for. But I was cocky enough to think, uh, with the Olympics changing over and getting away from the summer games, two years later they're going to have one in Norway, another four years after that, Japan, and then. And I thought, I was only 21, who cares? I'm going to be in three more anyway. <laughs> and that didn't happen, but I thought it would at the end. I made a couple of world championship teams, but uh, for whatever reason, just missed the next couple of Olympic teams. But 
those are very memorable um, feelings. And for some people, it's victory. And for some people, it's defeat. I'm sure Moose and I can commiserate now. It yeah. wasn't painful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, physically, it's painful. But I really thought it was going to come back for more. And, and like um, Billy was saying, how he, he was looking for those other thousands, I was sure I was going to come back and do better, but it just didn't happen. So um, thank you, all of you, for, for answering that. The, the next question I want to ask, and then I'm going to let um, Cameron ask some questions. This is just more of a discussion, and, and you don't all have to answer to it. But a lot of times, particularly this Olympics, um, the museum has been sought out to kind of speak about and, and talk about the Olympic legacy here in Steamboat Springs. And we talked about it here in the beginning. There's a legacy here that started, um, for all intents and purposes, with Carl House. And, and, and a lot of times I'll say um, to the media that comes to the museum that it's no coincidence that the place that Carl House and founded ski jumping and, and taught locals how to ski and compete and found the Winter Carnival is the same place that we were having all of these Olympic accomplishments in 2010 with this Nordic combined team that includes ski jumping. So there's this 100 year continuum of, of excellence and, and with Olympic excellence. And case in point, you all are here. I know um, Christine's kids are here, Nora and Ella, and one of the reasons why they wanted to come is because Chris and Caroline, their coaches, were going to be here speaking. So there's this kind of constant refeeding, reseeding of this Olympic legacy with these coaches coming back and, and getting Nora and Ella to the Olympics by coaching them and kind of this constant thing that's been going on for a hundred years and that's kind of my take on it but I can, no one can really pinpoint and I know Johnny you've been asked a lot this question, no one can really pinpoint why. Why Steamboat? Why are you guys back here? How, how are we constantly able to meet that incredible mark to be sending all of these Olympians every year because this is a really small town. It's not like you know some big city and we can say, okay, we're Vancouver and we sent 15 Olympians. We're this really small town and I would say not only do we send so many Olympians, but we also have a lot of Olympians living here and quote unquote retiring here. So if you could just kind of share your thoughts on anything that I've kind of hit on, um, I'd like to be able to respond to the media with some, something other than my opinion. I want your input, and I would, I would like to kind of formulate what this is all about. I kind of have a theory on that, just now coming full circle and coaching. Um, my family moved here in 95. I was a junior in high school. Um, so I was only really part of the, as an athlete of the Winter Sports Club for a year before I made the U.S. ski team um, when I was 16. Um, and, and then continued on in my career and, and was part of the community. And, but I really think uh, it's a, a couple things, but I think for one, the community of Steamboat is, is unlike anywhere I've ever been in the world. And I think we all can attest, we've traveled all over the world and been in ski towns and been around places that are really proud of their athletes and, and have tremendous athletes. But Steamboat is so unique because A, it's the heritage, but also just the community, the people. Um, and I think for that same reason, what, what makes Steamboat unique and maybe part of the why they have so many Olympians is that um, it's, it seems maybe more tangible for kids because they, they get to see Olympians, they see that um, it is attainable, and so that it's not such a far out dream. Um, in some ways, maybe that's a little bit of, of a curse in ways because maybe it seems easier than, than in fact it is, but I, I think just the reality for, for so many kids, I mean, a lot of kids, I think they think, oh, I could never do that, so I never even want to allow myself to dream. Whereas I think in Steamboat, because it, it's part of our culture, there is that opportunity to dream that a lot of kids, they don't get. So I think, um, I mean, I had it, like Chris said, I had it since I was eight years old to be an Olympic athlete. I remember giving a fake interview in a French accent and <laughs> <laughs> my medal and, um, and that was all on my own. But I think just now being a part of this this community and, and just seeing our young kids, the kids that we coach, you know, Chris and I, that these kids that coach, they see it, they they can experience it firsthand. And um, I think that's a really unique place and I don't I don't know anywhere else in the world like that. And I can elaborate on that, because I, I think uh, of anybody at this table, I'm the newest to this community. Uh, so we're kind of going backwards in terms of history and how and why, and, and, and how do I end up here? Uh, and I've just been here for six years. Um, so there's the community, as Caroline said, and, 
you know, you, you just look at our facilities. And uh, if you've been an Olympian, if you've been involved in sport, and then you're making a, uh, some career choices, and you want to stay in the sport, uh, you're an athlete, and now you get older, and you, you have some education behind you, and you still have your passion, and you're an expert in this field, and you want to give back, uh, this is the place to be. I mean, you've got facility, you've got community, and so as a coach, as an organization, the Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club, that's a very attractive place for a professional coach to land. So there's a lot of questions to that, I mean, a lot of answers to that question, you know, uh, which can start at the very beginning from 100 years ago, um, but the, the person who's kind of the, the freshest and, and newest, and you know, I've got a flag here in Hallison Hill, and and now I have a daughter, and of course this is the community where I want to raise my daughter, and this community represents everything that I want for myself and for my family, and it also supports what I believe in athletically. Uh, so I think that is very attractive to an Olympian. Anybody else want to speak to it? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I wouldn't underestimate the free pass from the ski area from an alpine ski <laughs> perspective. Um, <laughs> That's, that's a cherry on top, but when I was you know, told I would not be ski racing anymore, at least this national team wasn't going to pay for it anymore, um, I was living in Boulder with my wife and we had a six month old baby and I was pretty sure I didn't want to raise a kid in Boulder, although I love Boulder and I would have stayed there forever had we not had kids. My wife decided she didn't want to work for Power Bar anymore and didn't want to travel to California. She wanted to open a Pilates studio in Steve. And I said, hold on, I'm going to think about some other ski towns. And the more we thought about it, the more we had visited different ski towns around Colorado, we just saw no other choice um, between how easy giving our kids a chance to be winter sport athletes or an opportunity for that, for us to still enjoy winter sports, uh, notably skiing, but also anything else. And then the size of the community for a ski town. But then, you know, obviously we weren't looking for a huge town. We also weren't looking for something too remote. Um, and you can get everything in between in Colorado. But this was the perfect place, and the people were so friendly here um, all the time. I mean, I used to rip turns just visiting. We had a condo up in the mountain, and I would just take my, my GS keys and, and make turns straight down the face of Heavenly Days and see a patrol at the bottom, and instantly I felt like I was getting a speed speeding ticket when you go by the cops and your heart goes up in your throat, and you're like, oh, and then all of a sudden they just wave. <laughs> And you ski by going, hey, and you wave back. And it's not like that anymore, but it was like <laughs> when I before I moved here, it was like that. And I thought, man, you can ski fast in steamboat. This is great. Um, I love this place, and now they're going to give me a pass for the rest of my life. So we're going to steamboat. But it's really the community and uh, and and the ease of being able to do what you love uh, and right across the river here, and and it was really good. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I would just make sure that we all recognize how special this winter sports club is. And and uh, one guy, Carl Housen, started something a long time ago that snowballed to this, and it just keeps getting better and better um, with age. Um, the fact we have great partners in <clears throat> Mount Werner and, and the Steamboat Springs uh, Resort Corporation and uh, the City of Steamboat Springs and how that those three organizations really uh, are able to keep this momentum going. Um, to be able to offer so many different sports, we've all traveled around the world. I, I've never seen a winter sports club that offers so many options for kids. And so you, you meet the needs of more that way. And, um, and it's, it's just, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. All these pieces <coughs> coming together uh, don't equal the sum of their parts. It's, it's magnified. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's something where, um, now that I'm a coach, I've, I've coached here, I came right from my Olympic career, uh, was offered a job here in Steamboat uh, by a coach who's actually one of the national team coaches right now. And he said, well, I've got to, I'd really like you, if you're gonna retire, I'd really like you to come coach for me in Steamboat. And I said, you know what, I've been in this sport a long time and uh, I've got some ideas of what I wanna do and I, and I just am anxious to do that. And he said, well, don't forget that uh, people sacrificed a lot for you and uh, once you've retired as an athlete, you're only halfway there. Then um, you need to turn around and give back because guess what, nobody else will. And I thought about that, about all the people that had helped me get to where I had been and all the couches I'd slept on and 
all the coaches that had given me advice. And I really hit home, and I said, okay, I'll do this for a couple months. I'll do this for a winter. And uh, 22 years later, I find myself still here. Um, but you find out what, what an intense uh, purpose you can have and, and, and how grateful we all are for our experiences. Now you have the power to pay it forward and, and pass the baton on to the next generation and how important that is, how, inv how valuable that is. But we couldn't do that if it weren't for the foundation of this Winter Sports Club and keeping it going. So uh, I, I think that is the cornerstone of what's going on here is, is how this community embraces that, feels that it's so important, supports it, um, and that we keep driving the city for more facilities and better facilities and more sports. And 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 I know it's driving them crazy, but uh, we sure do appreciate it. And, uh, and obviously, I think um, <coughs> this natural ski jumping hill here, so when Deb spoke to facilities, especially for ski jumping, and you've got three facilities like this in the country, so I think that's that's got to be huge as well, at least for, for Nordic combined and ski jumping. So, anybody else want to speak to um, that question, or should we move to another question? Okay, we'll move on. Okay. Um, I have a question that is two questions in one, you can answer both or one. But uh, first of all, what advice would you give to kids who are just like you guys were at eight or whatever and trying to get on the Olympic team? And what advice would you give to parents? Anybody? <laughs> um, the advice I'd give to kids is, you know, just enjoy what you're doing. Um, find the thing that you have the most fun at and then go after it with all your heart because that's what you'll be the best at. The more you can enjoy it, the more fun you'll have, um, the more likely you, you'll be to be successful. And, you know, there's, there's tremendous, as they just kind of spoke to, there's tremendous opportunity here in this town between, you know, you, you look at Ellen and Nora, and they have two Olympians as their coaches. I'm their neighbor. You know, it's kind of one of those things where they're, you're around the, this culture all the time, and so just success kind of continues to breed success. And so, you know, my advice is just to find what you want to do and, and go after it with all your heart. And then for the parents, I guess my advice is to let them do that, you know. Don't force them into something that they don't want to be doing or push them too hard. You know, the, the idea behind skiing is that it's fun, and that's why we do it. And for as long as the kids continue to have fun, you know, continue to support them, and then if there comes a time when they don't want to do it, that's, that's the way it goes. Anybody else? I'll, I'll start. Um, I think advice for kids would be you may be in one sport right now and think, oh, that's what I'm going to be looking or that's what I'm going to go forward, but it may change. I actually didn't start racing snowboarding. I started snowboarding when I was 12, but I didn't start racing until I was 22, and then became an Olympian You know, a couple years after that. So really, when I was eight, I had no idea I was going to be an Olympian. I didn't have a goal. I actually thought I might go to the X Games for rollerblading for some reason. That was <laughs> super random, but you know, if you excel in what you do right now, it could change. So just, you know, keep that in your head too. You never know. If you get disappointed in something you've done here and it doesn't lead you to where you go, like me, it may change and then you may go later in life. And then advice to parents, do not be a helicopter parent. <laughs> My husband was a coach and he actually brought us to Steamboat and that's how I arrived here. And there was a few parents who were helicopter parents, meaning they were always there, they're on the side of the half pipe, they're on the side of the slope style, like almost talking over the coaches. And I think kids you know, they love their parents, but they respond more to coaches, like cool Olympian coaches and so forth. So, you know, be there supportive, like Johnny said, you know, let them do what they want to do, but just don't, I guess, overrule the coaches. <laughs> anyway. I, I, would, uh, I would elaborate on that um, from both of you guys. And, and just, I, I was very fortunate that the year I came here to coach, the first year, Johnny was 12 or 13 years old. so. Um, I watched him grow up as an athlete, and, and I can tell you my experience watching his parents um, with Johnny, and, and we come, those of us that are coaches, come from such a great standpoint, uh, because you get to see how families handle each other, and, and, and no way is right or wrong, uh, it's just interesting to watch. I'll never forget Johnny's parents, uh, uh, Johnny's dad, Johnny would be upset about something, and, and uh, Jim would say, Johnny, 
we don't have to do this. We can go fishing tomorrow. You know, <laughs> there was there was never any pressure for Johnny. This was his thing. He owned it, and and uh, he took responsibility for it. Um, it wasn't outside forces that were forcing it on him. It was 100% his. This is what he wanted to do, and his parents let him do it, provided the things that he needed, um, but stayed back and and actually encouraged him to do other things when it got rough, like hey, you know. But it was kind of the acid test. Um, and, and for the kids, I, I'd say, um, you know, in, in so many things in life, you fail yourself to success. So it's the ability to get back up, dust yourself off, and keep going, and, and, and not let things knock you off your block, not let anybody or anything steal your dream. Um, develop that dream, and in and 22 years of coaching, I'd say the number one ingredient that kids need to have is passion. It, it's, that's what keeps you going when the weather's bad, when body aches when, uh, when it gets going when tough and it will get going there will be tough times um, that's what keeps you going and parents I would re reiterate what Aaron said is is let your kids go through that um, as much as you can we all have a tendency to want to protect our kids and and to pave the way for them and make it easy for them um, I would say especially not in the beginning um, because kids kids need to learn how to do things on their own and they gain more, especially at a young age, and more confidence from doing things on their own. Help them out and give them the tools they need, sure, but know that balance between helicopter parent, snowplow parent, <laughs> lawnmower parent, um, and, and what they need. I'd say for kids, if, if um, I'd say this is in addition to what these guys have said and not in replace of what they've said, but don't be afraid to be competitive. Don't let someone tell you that no, 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 you just do this to be fun. A lot of us are competitive naturally, and we feel like you get a B on your math test and your buddy got an A, and you're thinking, how do I, yeah, I want to get an A now too. And you go back and study a little more so you can get that A. That's, that's just competitive, and, and I think that's human nature in a lot of ways. And, and so a lot of people these days are telling you that's man, don't do that, you're gonna burn out, don't get competitive. I, I would actually say, if you're that way, Fuel it, like enjoy it. Um, if you're getting 10th and you want to be top five, you're gonna just get crafty. Try to think about what you have to do to get to get top five. What do you have to do to get that A? And and let your creative center and your mind think about that when you're sleeping at night. And you, if, if it's a goal of yours to get better because you want to for whatever reason. I mean, it can be because you hate to lose. It can be because you just like to do better. Whatever your reason is, be don't be afraid to be competitive. I would say. That's a good thing, and, and, and you're always going to be striving. If you're competitive and you want to do better, if you want to be top 30, top 10, if you want to win, that's a good thing. Go ahead and shoot for that, and because that's what's going to make you, you know, and you don't want to do what, you don't just do your sport all the time, but just try to strive in whatever you're doing, and hopefully you'll do a lot of different sports, and that can just become part of your character, um, hopefully not to an annoying degree like I have, but more just something that helps you get better. But that's what I would say for kids. And uh, for, for parents, um, I, I think you have to be honest with yourself if you're actually an expert in what your kid's doing or not. And if you're not, trust the coaches. If you are, coach them like I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the best you coach. Coach. <laughs> I'll add to all that. Uh, I, what I'd say to parents and athletes is let sport teach. Because all the lessons that sport is going to teach, you do not want to teach that under your roof. Uh, let sport do it. And we as parents like to be the experts, and we like to control, and we like to have answers. And there aren't answers. You cannot conjure up the answer for sport. The, the experience of sport, competing, the ups and downs, sport teaches that. With, you can just be gone, and sport's going to teach. So let sport teach. And then the other thing I'd say is uh, I believe that the people who are the most successful are the most innovative and kind of self-aware in figuring out your own personal situation. Every family, every athlete is going to have challenges. Could be a challenge of excess. You just got so much, a plethora. Or it could be a challenge of location. It, every family is going to have a challenge. And you have to be real about what your challenge is, your strengths, your liabilities. Recognize those, and how are you going to work with that? So I think the people that 
are the most successful, the families that are the most successful, the kids are the most successful, figure that out and, uh, and negotiate their circumstance the best and they're the most innovative with that. What I'd like to do now is to open it up to the audience and you guys probably have a lot of questions that you'd ask them so I'm going to zip it and if you raise your hand then go ahead. Can I take a picture of you guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to take my phone out and snap. I thought they'd be like, is that okay if I take Well, if you're in it. <laughs> 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 is it in your lap, though? No. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have a question? Yes. Um, why did you want to be in the military? Why did you want to be in <laughs> I, yeah, I can start it off. I didn't plan on the Olympics. I, I saw it on television when I was really young, but it was in a faraway land and I had never seen it before and didn't know what it was and didn't connect with it really. And so I felt like I didn't realize that I could go to the Olympics until much later. And, um, and I thought in, in sports and now in life, but especially then, in sports, you always want to be progressing, and you're always learning and getting better. And I always thought of it as a road that just keeps going up and up. And once I realized that the Olympics was the top of that road, I thought, well, that's where I want to go. That's that's the the end end of that path. Uh, but it really wasn't until a lot later. A lot, a lot of people said they were seven, eight years old. For me, it probably wasn't until I was 14 or 15 that I started to realize maybe I could go there. Um, just realizing that that's the ultimate, ultimate place in our sport. I was kind of the kid that Chris is talking about. I was really competitive, still am. Um, and so I, I think as a little kid, I just wanted to be the best. So I knew the Olympics was was kind of the top of that, uh, of, of really of all sports. So I just wanted to be the best. So I wanted to, to go into the Olympics. That was it, pretty simple. <laughs> For me, oh, sorry. For me, um, it seems I'm a little opposite than all these because my the snowboard cross that I do just came in 2006. So for me, my first goals were the X Games, and that's where these three medals are from. And every year, I get to the X Games, it's on TV, it's cool, it's awesome, you know. And and then finally, in 2006, our sport, um, or my discipline, got into the Olympics. So then it was a new strive, and it was a new. Okay, I have the X Games. I've done some of those. Let's see if I can get to the national team and go to the Olympics. So it was definitely the next step. You know, I've done the X Games, that was awesome. Olympics, super awesome. And I'll get there. So that's what I, my focus was. I was a little more like Nelson in that I knew I wanted to be on the US ski team. I didn't know really to shoot for the Olympics, but I was very aware of Franz Klammer was, and I wanted fishers just like those red blue <laughs> fishers, just like Franz Klammer. But it wasn't until um, the Norant came to Crested Butte where I grew up and I got to watch guys like uh, Andy Lund and Bill Johnson and Jace Roman, who lives in town here, I could hear them on the down the before I could see them, and then they'd go by and And I thought, oh my god, that is so cool. And that's when I thought, I want to be on the U.S. ski team, because our club had a, a banquet for the U.S. ski team during that race, and we got to see them all, and they were just such, they just seemed like the coolest guys I've ever seen in my life, and I, I just thought to myself, well, I want to be on the U.S. ski team, and I'm telling all my friends, I want to be on the U.S. ski team from the time at eight or nine, um, but then it wasn't until I got older, like Nelson said, we realized, well, people make the U.S. ski team, but then the Olympics is the high, higher level than that, so you, you, once you start racing longer, you just start deciding to set your sights higher and try to go to the Olympics. So. Next question? Somebody must have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Eric. Um, are there some unwritten rules about what you can and can't do in border cross? In terms of <laughs> there are some un unwritten, slightly written, I guess. You can defend yourself this, so if you know Johnny and I are going down and he's close to me, I can do this, but I can't extend. Can That's yeah, like I can, I can, you know, if he's like we're really close and we kind of hit, I can do this, but if as soon as I extend and they happen to see that, I could get pulled out. And that's a real so, 
Um, I'm not sure if it's a rule book or not, but <laughs> there's definitely been a few controversies within, you know, and they'll replay videos and they'll look at it, well, he did this and he, he didn't hold his line and, you know, he came around that, you know, you're both going around a bank corner and this guy pushed that guy and he ended up off the track. You get so you involved within the community. You would probably would. <laughs> Especially in the air. Yes, yeah. So I know a girl and I collided in the air and I flipped around backwards and I ended up finishing the race going switch, so the opposite way that I'm used to going. Um, but you know, again, I, I didn't fight it or anything because I knew we just hit in the air. You know, there's nothing that we could have done differently. So I never actually read a rule book to snowboard cross, but <laughs> maybe they have one now, I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? I have one other question. This is something I've always wanted to ask Olympic athletes, and this is Olympics, summer, winter, whatever. Uh, what is it like to transition back into society after, after you're done? Uh, you know, whether it's from an injury or you decide to uh, retire on your own, what is it like to go back and leave the cheering crowds? I mean, you guys have kids, some of you, but they don't always cheer you on. So. <laughs> Well, I just did it really recently, so yeah. Um, for me, it was a really easy decision. It was something where I had done it for a long time. I was on the national team for 15 years. Um, I'd accomplished pretty much everything that I wanted to, and all of a sudden, for me, my family was more important to me than skiing. I was always really, really competitive um, from a young age, talk to the test of that. To I was competitive to a fault, where I re really set me back a lot of times. Um, but then I kind of lost that drive, I lost that competitive fire because now I had this new challenge and this new exciting thing, which was my family. Um, so for me, it's been, it was very easy. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'll speak to it. Uh, I think, you know, um, there's going to be a lot of different stories to that. My experience was I felt being involved in international competition, world-class competition for a very long time and such an important formative time in my life, you know, from 17 to 24 or whatever. I quit when I was very early, when I was 24. Uh, that, and, and what I always say is you get rewarded for very odd behavior uh, because it's very selfish, it's very one track, uh, and the better you get, you know, you just hone in a little bit more on these behaviors that make you more and more successful. I mean, there's only so many people that are the very best in the world at what they do. And to be the very best in the world at what you do, you, you hone in on particular behaviors that are going to get you there. But that's what separates you out from everybody else. And then you have success and, and you do well and then it comes time that you transition into the real world and you need to retool. So there, there's pros and cons to everything. And it takes time to transition. And you know, you're always you know, gonna have your nature of who you are. That's there when you're a youngster and that's there when you're 50. Um, but then there's the competitive instincts that you just cultivate more and more and more. It's a little bit like working out. You know, when I was working out, I was 25 pounds heavier than I am right now. I was as solid as I rock. And that was a very extreme situation because I was working out so hard and you stop working out like that and then all of a sudden your body kind of melts away. You don't have the same muscle. Um, you know, your mind is very, very sharp because 24-7 it's fight and flight. You know, every cell in your body is operating at 100% and that's not a normal way to live. Then all of a sudden when you don't have to live that way anymore, uh, you, you have to just adjust and you have to retool. And uh, so that's an interesting process and that takes some time. I wouldn't trade anything, but you know, you ask young racers uh, when they're in the, in the middle of what it is that they're doing and you get the question, Are you, you must be making great sacrifice. And then as a youngster you say, I'm not sacrificing anything. This is exactly what I wanna be doing. You know, my friends are at college and you know they're getting their medical degree or becoming lawyers or whatever they're doing and, and you're not sacrificing anything because you're you're participating in your sport but the the reality is you are you know you're because you're so focused on just this small little thing and you wouldn't trade because 
you know, you, you have this experience that nobody else on the planet has. Well, we all share this experience. There's a fraternity of, of what you share, and it's very special, and you treasure that. Um, but transition is different for everybody, but there's definitely retooling that has to happen. Anybody else here? Yeah, I, I, I want to talk to Deb about how she lost weight after she stopped working out. I just get to hear everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I think the, the best way to transition for me was, and I've seen people that haven't done it, and, and it, it, it's worked fine for some and not for others, but moving to Steamboat from Boulder and being told in April on the back porch in my, my backyard in Boulder I wasn't going to be able to represent the national team anymore. I came up to Steamboat without a job and without, I, I knew, I actually had the experience before I was done racing, the Winter Sports Club Alpine director at the time, Tony, Tony Nunnikoke, and told me he'd like to hire me. And I said, who have you been talking to? I'm still racing next year. <laughs> so he knew, I think as the word was out that I would, wouldn't be racing next year. But um, I took some time, a few months, where I just remodeled. I just worked on my house up here and remodeled and started to realize I was spending more money. I wasn't making any, I was just spending money on uh, Home Depot. So I realized, well, maybe I should go back down to the Winter Sports to get a job, at least have some income this morning, give back to the kids down there. This Winter Sports Club's a big deal. In this town, I should go give my knowledge. I'm right off the World Cup the last 10 years, and I should help some of these kids. It's a big deal down here. So, came down, got a job, and then two years later, was realizing just how much I like coaching. But it was a, it was the thing that allowed me to, to focus on other people's goals, and then I realized I liked it, and I liked focusing on other people's goals, and it was fun. It was fun to go help kids and then continue my competitive nature with my brother who was coaching the Aspen Club and we would just kill him. <laughs> He'd be sitting on the side of the hill of his hangover going, ah, oh, you guys just beat us, you kill us every week. And I just felt so good about that. <laughs> but every week. And uh, so, you know, you don't have to give up your competitive nature, but what you do have to do is get used to the idea, unless you made, a, you know, several millions during your career that you're still going to need to work, you're still going to need to make an income, and you're, and, and you're going to probably have to start to get used to the idea of serving others. And that's what made it really easy for me to make the switch, because I enjoyed it. And, um, and I think that the people that really struggle with it have a hard time for a lot longer period of time realizing people aren't just sitting around thinking about what they can do for, the, for, for that person. Mm -hmm. And they got to start thinking about what they can do for others. So. That's what I, that's what I had always wondered, is you spend your whole lives being focused. Everything is on you, your parents, your coach, and then it stops. And then how do you, like you said, how do you turn that focus into something positive? Because none of you obviously had a meltdown. It doesn't look like, or, you know. Like no, you know, but yeah. some people do it better than others. Yeah. You know what I mean? For some, it's a longer process. That's an excellent, excellent question. And, and, it, and it is a process, and I loved everything that you guys all said, uh, a process of being self-centered and being the center of attraction and going from Todd Wilson on the U.S. ski team, Olympian, you just taught us than the average guy. And, and there was a part of that that felt great, because I never really liked being in the limelight. Um, it really kind of was a relief to just be a regular guy. But you always kind of miss that. And, and so uh, I love the term retool, and, and I love the term what, what Chris was saying is the power of, of giving versus receiving. And to me, that's, that's been the greatest part is, um, it's so much more rewarding for me to give back to these kids and see the smiles on their faces and ignite those dreams than it ever was, um, even accomplishing the Olympics. Uh, seeing the next generation, um, the power of these children and their, their passion and their desires and their dreams and, and what they want to become, you really see that anything is possible. Um, and so I think that's the biggest transition. Focus on yourself to focusing on others. Well, we've got a little bit over, unless anybody has any questions. Doesn't look like it. Um, I have a question. All right. I see a lot of future Olympians out there. Now, who wants to go to the Olympics in this group? All right. Now, remember, folks, there's no age limit at the Olympics. So if you can beat, all right, if you can beat Bodie Miller, the U.S. ski team wants you. But if you want to go to the Olympics now, and one of the ways is to think about what it's like to be in the Olympics. 
And one of the best ways is, come on up here and try on one of these Olympic medals or world championship medals and see if they fit. All right, come on up. Come on up. Okay. Aaron, which one is your Olympic medal? These are all X Games, actually. Nothing is Olympic. Okay, Olympic medals. All right, you want to try a, or you want to hold this, that's Olympic medal. Or X Games, if you want to be the X Games. All right. And you want to try this on? This is from the World Championships. Let's see. That's just the right size for you. You should get one of those. 